go to Raipur, you go to Panjim in Goa, you will still find air quality which is, which is not meeting the prescribed air quality standards. And forget about the WHO norms which are even more uh, you know, stringent. So that means the air, air which we are breathing is not fit for our human health and probably deteriorating our lungs, our hearts and other parts of our body on a, on a continuous basis. This thematic event is organized to discuss issues at both regional and urban scales, to discuss what are the international experiences we have from both the developed and developing world, to discuss what are the experiences coming from, from Indian cities, because there are some cities which are a little ahead on this and which there are some which are trying to uh, cope up with the problem at this moment. And finally, uh, through this event, we would like to inform you about this uh, uh, partnership which we are starting with the Bil Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Ministry of Environment and uh, Forest and Climate Change. Uh, without taking a minute more, let me invite uh, people for the inaugural session. We have Dr. Ajay Mathur, Director General Terry. Sir, can I, can I invite you on the upstage? Ms. Ailun Yang. Director of Global Air Pollution Environment Program, Bloomberg Philanthropies. Dr. Prashant Gargav, Member Secretary, Central Pollution Control Board of India. Mr. Krishan Dhawan, CEO, Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. Give a welcome address. Thank you. Sumit, thank you very much. Ailun, Krishan, Prashant, and friends, welcome to this session. I think Sumit is absolutely right. Air pollution is one of those issues which bothers each one of us. And when I say bothers, it is something that all of us have had a personal experience of. And I think it's therefore important that we start looking at this in a organized manner, in a scientific manner. This is a critical problem. And as uh, Sumit mentioned, I think the number is something like 75% of the cities where data is collected, hey Prashant, the, 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 the air quality standards are violated. Some, some large number like that. And that completely surprised at least me when I first read about it. When I look at the satellite picture of India and look at the air pollution, the first thing that you see is this swath of air pollution all over India. This is not over urban areas. This is not over, uh, this is not just over urban areas. This is not just over rural areas. It's everywhere. In other words, the problem is bigger than being an urban, urban problem alone. I think this was uh, very aptly brought out in the source apportionment study, which we had the pleasure of uh, doing together with ARAI, where something like 35% of the pollution that you see in the NCR actually comes from outside the NCR, the National Capital Region. It is therefore important to know where this is coming from because if you want to address the source, the first thing to do is to find out where is the pollution coming from. And as I said, the swath of pollution across the country tells us that things that we take for granted, for example, the normal burning of biomass in chulas, in normal cook stoves, in homes, largely uh, uh, rural homes now, because uh, increasing number of urban homes now have cooked with using gas, is seen as a primary reason. So you have rural, you have urban, you have biomass used throughout the year, you have also the amount of biomass wastes that are burnt at particular times of the year. Note the regional scales, note the time scales. So it's a problem that is happening at several scales and obviously therefore interventions that are needed will be at several scales. We at Terry are delighted that to work on this issue, on bringing out what the issues are and therefore bringing out what the options to address those issues are together with the Ministry of Environment and Forests, the Central Pollution Control Board, uh, we are very, very grateful to the Bloomberg Philanthropies, to the Shakti Foundation, um, and other partners, Agri, WRI, uh, Urban Emissions, etc. In putting together a coalition of science-based 
uh, organizations looking at how uh, this pollution is being generated, where is it coming from, and therefore what are the kinds of interventions that would uh, reduce them. We look forward to a stimulating discussion today. We will also look forward to uh, the launch of this partnership of all these people I spoke about uh, tomorrow. And I do hope that the presence of people from across the country, across various specialities, uh, and in fact across the world, would help us move this discussion towards the direction of focusing on key interventions that are needed. I thank you all for being here, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathur. May I now invite Ms. Aileen Young, Director, Global Air Pollution Environment Program, Bloomberg Philanthropies. Just a brief introduction. She manages the international initiatives of the Environment Program at Bloomberg Philanthropies with a focus on climate, energy, and air pollution. Before Bloomberg, she has worked to advise major foundations on their ground making strategies in China. Over to you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Thank you, Dr. Samet. Um, I'm really honored to be here today. Um, I want to just um, echo what um, Dr. Ajay said. We do have a, a panel tomorrow morning um, that will give us uh, give people more details about our partnership. So I, I want to just keep my intervention very um, brief today, but welcome um, everybody to also come to our panel um, tomorrow morning. So we're really honored um, to be here, um, be, be part of um, this challenge. I often think that uh, what is um, the added value that we can bring um, to this problem, um, which is very big um, um, by itself, but and also what we can contribute here is very humble. But um, the way I think about um, really um, is our added value um, here are a few things. First of all, um, Bloomberg Philanthropy um, is the foundation of Michael Bloomberg. Um, no matter his um, record as um, a philanthropist or his um, experience as the three-term mayor of the New York City. Um, he is very committed to the issue of public um, health and also air pollution. Um, during his tenure um, as the New York City uh, mayor, the air pollution situation um, in New York actually became um, the best um, in um, 50 years. Um, actually, major pollutants uh, reduced by um, a very significant amount, and these are some of the things that he um, is very um, proud of and we really hope to bring that um, spirit to a lot of the work that we do um, around the world. Um, and also, I think uh, um, we don't just work in um, New York. We now have the experience and an opportunity to also work around the world. And, and today, we're also very happy to bring some of the international partner that we work with, um, um, Dr. Um, Frank Kelly from King's College um, London and uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Hakka Bing from Tsinghua University and many others. We really think um, this is a, a problem that uh, a lot of the sharing of international experience could be very beneficial and we want to um, help with that. However, uh, most importantly, um, we think the, in, uh, the solution to the problem here is with the capacity of the organizations on the ground here um, with the kind of government uh, uh, institutions um, here. So we think that uh, the most important thing is for our Indian partners to be in the driver's seat um, for our um, Indian um, government to really um, build a kind of uh, capacity needed to solve the problem. So we're really happy that we are announcing our partnership with the Indian Ministry of um, Environment, Forest and uh, Climate Change tomorrow. We're also happy to work with a list of uh, fantastic partners, in including Terry, Shakti, um, Darai, in India, uh, C-STEP, Adri, um, and, and many more. Um, with that, I want to um, thank everybody and uh, um, I hope we all have a wonderful discussion today. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Alun. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Prashant Gargav, who actually needs no introduction. And uh, he is actually, I mean, if you know him, he is the one who pioneered the source apportionment studies in India. And I know him for last almost 15 years. It's a pleasure knowing you, sir. And uh, I invite you for some brief remarks here before you have uh, you know, detailed presentation in the next session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumit. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
I am very glad to be here uh, seeing Sri Galaxy of Experts who will be discussing a very critical problem of air pollution. It is a very complex problem. The more we try to understand this, the more we try to work on solving the problem, we realize that it is a it is a complex problem. It is not something that can be immediately or easily solved. Ever since in 1981, when AIR Act was formulated, it was recognized as a problem and then actions, mostly in isolated form here and there, were being taken. But what we realize is that it is a science, it is a knowledge, it is evidence, information that is essential to make any program to deal with this situation. I can recall two milestone activities that helped shaping all our air quality efforts in this country. Number one, and I am extremely pleased, number one was a six city source apportionment that was done. Uh, Terry was a partner in that in 2010. And I am so pleased to see Dr. Pradeepto Ghosh, he was the secretary of Environment Forest when the study was conceptualized, initiated, and the first concept note I presented uh, before him. And when the study was concluded, the report was accepted by the government. Shri Vijay Sharma Saab, he is also here. So I made the final report presented before him. So the two eminent people who gave the first science-based policies to this country are here. I am so glad that you are here, sir. Second milestone activity I would say is Air Quality Index that was launched by Honorable Prime Minister in 2015. Now with that, when we started sharing information on air quality with people in the easy to understand language I think it became a public problem. Earlier, it was not a public concern, but when we started giving more and more information in terms of AQI, in terms of our likely health impacts of different air pollution levels, uh, it got momentum. So with these two landmark actions that this Indian government initiated, I think we have some sort of clarity as to what, are, what is the problem, as to what are we supposed to do. We have a clear roadmap and with that roadmap, a national clean air program was also launched recently on 10th of January, uh, which provides uh, list of actions, activities, a complete vision as to how do we proceed further. If I can come back to the point that I was saying that it, is, it has to be knowledge-based. I am so happy that we have experts here. We have to learn from whatever has been done elsewhere, internationally. We don't have to repeat, don't have to reinvent things. And learning from them, uh, I think we'll have to commit ourselves to the cause. And I'm hoping that in years to come, uh, we should be able to solve this. It takes time, as I said, it's not something that can be done Overnight, it takes time, but then uh, we have a clear understanding, a clear roadmap ahead of us. And with everyone's support, I am sure that we should be able to improve in air quality, uh, at least uh, to begin with, to the standards that we have prescribed, uh, not to the WHO. That might be difficult, uh, seeing the background level that we have. Uh, but certainly, uh, the standards that we have prescribed, we should be able to achieve them. Uh, you know, within a given time frame. So with this, I'll close. 
Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gargav, for your uh, uh, kind words. Uh, we now conclude this inaugural session and request the esteemed guest uh, for a photo opportunity to the photographers. May I request uh, Dr. Gargav and Mr. Dhawan to remain seated for the first session which we are starting and we'll be discussing the equality challenge along with the international perspectives. And uh, may I now invite our international guests, uh, Professor He Kebin from China and Professor Frank Kelly to come up stage for joining them uh, for session one. And I request uh, Mr. Dhawan, uh, CEO Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation to chair this session. Uh, I mean, just a brief introduction, he actually don't need any introduction, but uh, he brings a lot of uh, experience from the corporate sector, he's uh, leading the uh, Shakti Foundation, he most recently was managing director of Oracle, and so on. Sir, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, why don't you take a seat along with us? Thank, Thank you. you. So, much. so uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So it's a distinct pleasure to be here to uh, assist in uh, moderating this really important uh, conversation. Um, we're running behind time, so we've been asked by the organizers to be very particular about uh, managing time. Uh, we have three very eminent speakers with us this uh, evening, uh, who will all be speaking for eight minutes each. And uh, we will wait for them to make their presentations, and at the end of the three presentations, we will open up the conversation uh, for questions and answers uh, from the audience, so kindly uh, hold, hold your questions uh, till, till then. So the, the three speakers are, and I won't get into uh, lengthy or detailed introductions, <coughs> um, we have Sumit Sharma, who uh, is the Director of Earth Sciences and Climate Change at Terry, our host, uh, one of our hosts today. Uh, we have Professor um, he Ke Bin, who's uh, a professor of environmental engineering at Tsinghua University in China. And we have uh, Frank Kelly, who's professor of environmental health in King's College in London. So I think it's a very appropriate uh, group of speakers. Um, uh, Sumit will, of course, focus on uh, the, uh, the situation prevailing uh, in India around us as we speak. Uh, but uh, we look forward to hearing from both uh, Professor Heike Bin and Professor Kelly on their perspectives from uh, their particular geographies. Uh, London, of course, uh, well, became famous in 1952, was it? For the great smog that killed, I believe, 4,000 people in a short period of time. Since then, uh, I think they uh, certainly came out of it. And it'd be interesting to see and hear what the current situation and challenges are. I know it isn't without challenge, the current situation, but a clearly an improvement uh, since the early 50s. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see what they're doing, uh, particularly I, I read recently about a very aggressive um, surcharge for cars coming in, as much as 24 pounds to drive in uh, into the city. And of course, uh, China and Beijing uh, have, until India displaced them, uh, sort of held center stage on the, uh, uh, sort of had the, you know, it's a dubious distinction for us to have displaced them, but they held center stage on the uh, issue around poor air qualities in the cities, um, which sort of brought, came to uh, intense focus uh, back in 2008 when China was hosting uh, the Olympics, but they've made significant and very creditable progress since then in addressing some of the issues that come along with rapid urbanization and industrialization issues that we in India now face, and I think there's uh, much to be understood and learned from the China experience. So with that, uh, Sumit, may I request you to start uh, your eight minutes, start now. So let me start with this, uh, so many, I mean, you must have seen this picture so many times. What it shows is on the x-axis you have all the cities where air quality monitoring is happening in India and bars shows the PM10 levels and the blue horizontal thing is the standard. What you can see is wherever you go, 70 to 80 percent cities in India are not meeting the prescribed 60 microgram norm uh, on an annual average basis. 
the chart also shows the spatial chart shows the swath which uh, dr mathur was talking about it's it's not only about the cities but the whole indo gangetic plain is covered with this uh, you know layer of smog uh, it's not only indo gangetic plain you can see the central part of india you can see the western part of india and you can also see something coming from the western boundaries and that's basically the natural dust blowing towards india and adding to the pollution uh, 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 numbers uh, in indian domain what are the impacts there are studies which are quoting 0.6 million to 1 million people dying just because of air quality there are differences in estimates because we don't have our own indigenous dose response curves and there is a great need to develop them to ascertain these kind of numbers there are research studies which are quoting 20 to 30% of loss of wheat just on account of very high ozone pollution in india there are impacts on buildings like taj mahal golden temple and then there are impacts on climate as we know there are particles which are black in color which warms the atmosphere and then there are particles which are not allowing the radiations to reach the earth's surface and cooling the surface causing climatic disruptions there are papers which are quoting there are changes in precipitation patterns which are happening in india on account of high aerosol loading all this leads to lot of economic loss and loss of image we have a cricket match happening and players stop playing on account of very high air pollution in delhi now that's all uh, we can say on impacts but they are uh, you know whatever the numbers says they are no small numbers and we are facing huge damage uh, on on all the fronts let's talk about delhi this is how uh, the levels have uh, gone uh, in in last uh, almost 19 20 years uh, there was time when there was a slight dip in pm10 concentrations in early 2000s uh, because of the measures you took in in the city but after that the growth was such and not just in delhi but in all the surrounding towns uh, around delhi which led to this unprecedented uh, you know uh, rise in pm10 levels we were talking about annual averages this is what happens episodically the levels go up to 450 and sometimes 700 800 micrograms on a daily basis in a city like delhi this basically shows how the fire events happening in the upwind region of delhi are are uh, you know uh, causing the air pollution in delhi to go up we we'll talk about what are the contributions at the national scale this is what our estimates say that in pm 2.5 it's the biomass burning happening in rural kitchens and industries are the two major chunks in terms of nox it is the transport sector which is contributing heavily but in terms of pm 2.5 the contribution of transport sector at the national scale is is 4 5% now the thing changes dramatically if you change your focus from national to, to city level the share of transport which was 4% at the national scale increases dramatically to almost 50% in bangalore 20 25 to 30% in delhi and approximately same in in other cities so that means if you're talking about city level action plans transport sector becomes very very important however at the national scale it's the residential and industrial sector which are important this is the latest thing which dr mathur was talking about uh, which we have done uh, in collaboration with with arai and this source apportionment tells us and we applied two different approaches dispersion and, and receptor and we found you know similar results the vehicular contribution in delhi is about uh, 28 30% in winters and about 70 20 17 to 20% in summers because in summers you get lot of dust from both uh, uh, you know natural and uh, uh, anthropogenic origin which eclipses the share of other other sectors industries they are not so many industries in delhi but if you see the national capital region there are so many industries which are still using fuels like coal which are are uh, contributing to this pie of pollution in delhi now from where the pollution is coming if we can focus our attention to this first bar 36% of pollution in delhi is contributed by their own sources 34% from rest of ncr 18% from rest of india and 13% is coming from international boundaries so what it clearly shows is that you have to put in multi level efforts you have to put in uh, all the players on the same table if you really want to solve this problem of pollution in delhi we also tried to uh, project the future what we found is that 
despite the measures which are already planned. So there are, uh, you know, BS6 vehicles which are about to come, LPG penetration is going up, CNG expansion is happening. Despite that, in next 10, 12 years, the air quality is going to deteriorate. It shows that the, the concentrations which are about 110 microgram on an annual average basis can go up to 118. So there will be slight further deterioration of air quality. But this could have been worst if these measures are not in place. That means there is already a 30% reduction which is going to happen because of uh, uh, the measures planned. But this also shows that we need to take so many other measures for further control of air quality and trying to bring them within the standards. So we ran the model for different strategies and what we found is that other than the benefits you are going to get in the biomass sector, in the transport sector, uh, doing fleet modernization and reducing real world emissions, you can get tremendous benefits in the industrial sector if we can switch the sector to gas. And uh, this is where the chunk lies and uh, we must focus our energies there. So this is uh, what I call as chart of hope. We should not lose hope. There's a great possibility that Delhi can achieve its ambient air quality standards. And uh, you know, uh, if you put in all the measures which we have prescribed, we can achieve the standards by 2030. Same things can happen at the national scale with the continuation of uh, implementation of NCAP, its activities uh, which are listed here uh, in different sectors, we can actually get this kind of situation. On the left hand side, we have a chart which is the current baseline situation and can get into a zone where, where the air quality is within the standards all across the country if we uh, you know, put in right measures uh, all across the country. So I'm, I'm just trying to close my presentation and trying to be within the limits. This is the last slide, which this is the work which we did with the, the Shakti Foundation la last year which actually shows the integration required between air quality and climate efforts. So India is moving on a trajectory of low carbon pathway through our committed INDCs. It can lead to 13% reduction in energy. Subsequently, it can automatically lead to 13% reduction in PM 2.5, 3% reduction in ozone, and corresponding reduction in health and agricultural impacts. So that means the integration of these two, two uh, strategies can provide you significant co-benefits and uh, there is a clear sense in going in this way. So thank you so much, sir. I, I just close at this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you for giving us that uh, national backdrop, which uh, allows me now to uh, request Professor K. Binhay to speak. Thank you. I'm just hoping to slow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's really my pleasure here to share some of the experience in China in recent years to fighting with the blue sky. Uh, so it's achieving blue sky in China and beyond. Uh, I think that, uh, several years ago, here we have the satellite information from NASA. Uh, we can see for PM 2.5 uh, uh, information, the strong synchrony is happening in eastern China and northern India. So we have a, we have a similarities that these two countries and the similar ch uh, challenges for pollution and also the visibilities and the, uh, uh, health impacts. So in 2013, the Chinese government has. Uh, initiative, a national clean air action plan is issued by a state council. And this is the first time is China just identify uh, within five years the important, uh, there's some key area, for example, Polo River Delta, Yangtze River Delta, and Beijing and surrounding area should be improved by 25% to 15% for the air concentration. So that is a very tough job uh, because the growth rates of the economy still keeping uh, seven around seven. So this is a problem. Uh, we have, uh, you know, first you have to understand the, uh, scientifically what is the real problem, which means we need the monetary inventory and the modeling work. So in, in that, within uh, one, uh, three years, we have established more than 1,500 national monetary uh, stand, uh, stations, 
and also they have uh, a LIDAR, ground-based LIDAR information, satellite information, and also the mobile uh, uh, observation uh, uh, the, the, the system. So they can understand the source approachments, uh, also the geography, uh, which uh, sectors is important and which area should be coordinated together as it's a regional air quality uh, program. So for the last five years, we have done some of the important uh, actions. The first one is uh, uh, to improve the energy structure, especially for coal consumption. It gets a uh, capture the coal consumption and uh, uh, from the uh, two, uh, four point billion tons 2013 to uh, 3.9 million tons in the year 2017. And the, the, the proportion, uh, the ratio of coal of total energy uh, dropped to uh, from 26, uh, 16, 7 to 16%. This is uh, energy. And the second one, we have the national wide emission abandoning uh, 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 projects. Uh, here is just an example for power plants. So you can see they, they, they still uh, keep uh, tightening the emission standards. For example, uh, uh, SO2, uh, uh, 2000, uh, 1996, the emission standard is 1,200, but today it's only 35. So, and uh, now it's an ultra low emission standard for coal fire power facilities. Uh, it's not only for power, but also for the iron and the steel industrial and cement industrial, even the glass, uh, the in flat glass industrial has been banned, uh, the, the, the uh, tightening emission standards. The third part is a uh, household energy use. China has a large area, they have a winter heating season problem, and they have a using coal, and that is generates uh, a lot of pollution. So they have a switch coal to natural gas or electricity uh, within recent two years. Uh, the, 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 for the mobile source, we still have a you know, it's, uh, getting tightened uh, following the uh, Euro, Euro system. And we were just uh, studying the uh, Euro 6. Uh, we call it the China 6. It's quite closing. Uh, uh, the the uh, July of this year. So they have uh, reduced a lot of uh, uh, emissions uh, from mobile source and also starting to do something for the non roads. So in summary, we have done a lot of uh, reductions it's an energy structure, industrial structure, and also the major emission reduction project, or all of them. So you have to an uh, action plan, the so-called action plan. You have done a lot of working, but what happened for the air quality? Uh, so we, we are concerned two important things. One is a total emission. What is a reduction scale of the total emission? And the second one is a, what happened for the air concentration? So the first we have doing the uh, post evaluation recently for the last five years. The, in whole China, the national wide, the SO2 emission has been reduced by uh, 59% and 21% for NOx, and the primary uh, PM2.5 is 33%. The only problem is uh, VOCs. It's a little bit increased. That's a very difficult part. Uh, and also, it's similar trends for Beijing and surrounding area, and Pearl River Delta and Yangtze River Delta. So it's one of the typical example is SO2. You can see for the last 25 years or 27 years, China has really reduced the SO2 emissions, uh, especially for the red parts, uh, that is from power plants and heating. So compared to 20, uh, 1990, the the 2017 total emission is only one third of the uh, 1990. So if you look at the total, the construction of the number of the power plants actually is keep increase, and also the electricity generation is also uh, keep increase. So the only thing is that after 2005, the the power plants become blue and uh, uh, green color which means they got the uh, emission standard, tightening emission standards, and also the ultra lower emission standards. So here is uh, some information from the, uh, the NASA uh, satellite information. 
uh, that is uh, generated by one of the group from Marinette University uh, uh, in United States. They can show you from the last 10 years, China's SO2 has been reduced a uh, huge, but uh, in the same period, the India, uh, uh, the SO2 uh, synchronous is uh, increased. So I, I think now it's quite similar for these two countries. Our Indian uh, colleagues has more and more problem, the, the task of to do for, for the SO2 control. Uh, not only SO2, but also PM2.5 and other, uh, and, uh, uh, other uh, uh, the pollutants, they have the problem. Uh, but the only problem is that ozone is getting a little bit higher. So we have divided, you know, or we have a lot of uh, more than 10 or 20 control measures. We can divide it into which, uh, uh, which measures can uh, contribute more for our uh, final contributions. So for the concentration, uh, so that, that is a post evaluation for that. And finally, today we still have a uh, challenges here uh, that the, that because the total, if you compare with uh, China, US, and the EU 28, countries, our total emissions is uh, still very high because these three units has a similar land area, which means our emission density is uh, still uh, two to five times compared to the uh, U.S. and the EU. So that is a real problem. It, we have to do something in the future. So the, this, the future, we have the scenarios to, uh, to 2013. We have to, you know, you cannot do in the end of pipe only. You have to do in the energy structure and the industrial structure. And also, finally, you can do it not only the uh, uh, air quality problem, but also China has the commitments with the Paris agreements. We have to reach the carbon peak before 2013. So I think that is a future challenge, how to make the core benefit, stronger core benefit, for heat and carbon. I think I stop here. Uh, thank you for, uh, for attention. Thank you very much. So now uh, we'll uh, move uh, to our uh, third speaker, Professor Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to come here and uh, speak to you very briefly about the, the issues around air quality in London over the last 70 years. And uh, you will see very quickly that uh, this is something which is a challenge which doesn't get sorted out overnight. But there is a good message here if the right decisions are taken. So uh, London's air pollution story from pea soup smogs to an ultra low emission city. So this is a picture of London in 1952. You could uh, transform that into lots of the uh, major cities around India or, or China, as we've been hearing. This is the this was the situation in London and several other European cities 70 years ago. And of course, the reason for this was because, as an economy, we were totally dependent on burning coal, coal for energy production and coal for heating and cooking in our homes. However, today we have clean blue skies in London most of the time. Not every day, but most of the time. And of course the reason for that was a decision was taken in 1956 which followed the great London smogs in 1952 which led to an accelerated death of 4,000 people in the city in one week. And this really woke up our politicians and our media and our uh, activists. And this led to the change in Parliament. And the two major pollutants that you get from burning coal are black smoke and sulfur dioxide, the gas. And you can see here over the next 30, 40 years, these pollutants disappeared from our city air. You simply remove the power stations from inside the city. You put them outside the city away from people. You stop people from burning coal in their homes and you can quickly solve the problem. So this is a very good news story. Uh, of course, we had the benefits of North Sea gas come in uh, as an alternative to coal, but there are always uh, alternatives if you, can, uh, if you can be brave enough to take those decisions. However, that's the end of the good news story. It didn't last very long because whenever we got rid of these two pollutants, 
Along came another two pollutants, sneaking up on the city. They were invisible. We didn't know about them for a long time. But they came because of the increase in surface transportation. The big blue blob there is the number of uh, private vehicles on the roads in the UK. This is scale here is billions of kilometres travelled each year from 1950, you can see, up until modern time. An absolutely tremendous growth in this sector, which led to a big increase in emissions from this sector. So these tiny particles we can't see, PM2.5, and this gas, P uh, nitrogen dioxide or NOx, uh, coming from particularly diesel vehicles. So in urban areas, traffic is the main problem, and this is the main problem that we're dealing with in the UK now, especially in big cities like London. And so if you run the emissions model for a city like London, as you can see here, what lights up is the major road network. We've got the blob in the middle there, which is the centre of London, which is very congested, and then we've just got the major arteries. So anything that's red or yellow is above our standard for NO2. So that's the problem that we're facing today. And when we look at that in close uh, examination, as we can do when we do our source apportionment studies, you can see that road transport is responsible for two-thirds of the PM2.5 emissions in the city. So what is coming out the back of vehicles, out of the tailpipe, what is coming from the brakes, the exhaust and the roadware? These are all coming from uh, the movement of people around the city. And then if you take that and you break it down into the different sectors of the transport system, you can see that diesel cars, 11%, uh, taxis, nearly 18%, uh, TFL buses, 6.3%, uh, coaches, 3%. All of these big sectors, these big heavy-duty vehicles or the diesel vehicles really dominate the city and their emissions. And once you have that accuracy of information, you then are equipped to make some hard decisions if you're going to improve air quality. You've really got to hit those sectors which are contributing the most problems. So, in London, over the last uh, 15 years, we have had a number of schemes that have been introduced by our various mayors. In 2003, we introduced the <coughs> London Congestion Charging Scheme. This scheme was brought in overnight to reduce the number of vehicles coming into the city because a charge had to be paid. And overnight, 70,000 fewer vehicles came into the city and left the city each day. We increased our public transport uh, facility, the buses pr primarily, to give that uh, the increased uh, facilities for transport. But we were able to decrease the emissions from single-use vehicles. In 2008, simply to improve air quality, we introduced the London Low Emission Zone. So this meant that you could only travel into the centre of the city if your vehicle was of a certain emission standard. If it didn't, you had to pay a very large fine. And that again encouraged people either not to use their vehicle or to buy a new vehicle, a cleaner vehicle. Unfortunately, neither of these two schemes were sufficient to improve air quality to the standard which we still need to protect health. And so our current mayor is introducing next, well, in April, in two months' time, the new ultra-low emission zone. And this is the most ambitious and largest scheme in the world. And what it is doing it is saying that unless you have a Euro 6 diesel vehicle, so that means something that's been purchased just in the last two years, or a Euro 4 petrol vehicle, you cannot come into the city unless you pay an extra £12.50 a day. Now to come in, you already pay £12.50 for the congestion charge. Add another £12.50 to that, that's £25 a day, just to bring a vehicle into the city. There are not many people who are going to be able to afford to do that day in, day out. So we are expecting a big improvement in air quality as a consequence of this uh, major scheme. So this slide briefly shows you what happens in April 2019. It's uh, all those vehicles that are in the top there, the bikes, the, uh, the, the vans and the cars would have to pay that extra money. One year later, then London-wide, so that's everything out to the M25, that's a heavy-duty vehicle, that's a big bus, uh, a big coach, a big uh, HGV, will have to be of that standard as well, or they'll have to pay that fine. And the heavy-duty vehicle ones don't pay £12.50, they pay £100 a day. So it's really, really prohibitive if you haven't got the right emissions. <laughs> And then one year after that, the proposal is to take the uh, private vehicles 
the uh, standards out from the congestion charging scheme to what we call the North and South Circular. And this will bring in literally hundreds of thousands of new vehicles into this scheme. Now, the Mayor is, realises that he cannot just hit the private motorist and the TFL buses, etc. He realises he's going to have to hit all sectors. So as well as this low emission zone, he's bringing in this red bus, the London Red Bus uh, clean-up scheme, ultra-low emission scheme, where every new single-decker vehicle for the last 12 months that's been purchased has been an electric vehicle. We're testing uh, double-decker electric vehicles at the moment in London. Once they have a, uh, a, the clearance to go ahead, then we will purchase these as our new vehicles. And then the other big polluter I mentioned to you earlier was the London Black Cab. We have, since January 2018, uh, available in London, electric black cabs. So if you're going to bring a new black cab onto London Street, it has to be an electric vehicle. There are schemes, purchase schemes, to help cabbies replace their old diesel vehicles. So together, three, these three schemes, the black cab scheme, the bus scheme, and the ultra-low emission zone for Piper Motors, this is going to make a major difference in emissions in uh, one of the biggest cities in the world. And just to finish up, I'd like to say that to be able to bring in these schemes, you really need to have a solid foundation, an understanding of the source proportionment, the sources of those pollutants. And we at King's College have been working with the local and central government on these issues for the last 25 years. We run this dispersion model on behalf of the city. It's 20 by 20 metre resolution. Every emission in the city goes into it. Uh, it runs every hour. And then we also, as well, run the air quality monitoring network, it's 120 monitors across the city, which allows us to look at whether these regulatory systems are actually giving the benefit which we say they will do up front. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much Professor Kelly. So uh, I want to thank all, all three speakers. Uh, unsurprisingly there are obviously commonalities um, in, in the experiences that they narrated. Um, these aren't problems that happened overnight and neither are they problems that will go away but uh, overnight but will need um, a consistent uh, sort of uh, effort and um, I don't think uh, one can let one's guard down because um, as Professor Kelly mentioned one, one set of problems sometimes get cured we get a, another set of problems but broadly uh, the focus will have to be on transportation, power generation, industries, etc. So uh, before we move on to the Q&A, uh, actually uh, Mr. Gargov was uh, uh, also going to share some information on the National uh, Clean Air Action Plan. Um, so could I request you to do that and then we'll move on? Yeah. Well, I'm asked about, you speak about National Clean Air Program. Uh, in the interest of time, what essentially I'm going to do is, since the document is already in the public domain, uh, I won't get into the details. Uh, but uh, while running through the slides, you know, I'll pick up a you know, few key points uh, that uh, we, I feel are important uh, as we move ahead in implementation of the program. The challenges are known. As I said, the monitoring network is inadequate. Data analysis, dissemination, it improved through AQI, but there is uh, still a large gap. Uh, particulate matter, PM10 and 2.5 is essentially the problem at this stage. Uh, there is difficulty in gathering support, therefore this national clean air program which involves all the stakeholders, while there are actions taken by different agencies, different departments in an isolated manner, uh, but uh, there is lack of ownership as far as uh, air quality improvement is concerned. Public concern, as I said, in the inaugural, it's still uh, not there, and then we have capacity uh, limitations. The plan, the idea is that we must uh, deliver improved air quality within a given time frame. There are goals set in next five years. We are looking forward to bringing down PM10 2.5 levels uh, by 20 to 30 percent need to augment the network, bring more and more people on board, including public, by way of effective uh, data dissemination. Then implementation of a very comprehensive plan 
involving each and every stakeholder. The approach is collaborative, multi-sectoral, power sector, they have their own plans, transport sector, they have their own plans. So all these plans are integrated with a common objective of improving air quality. The basic framework, we are looking at knowledge as a base. As I said, uh, sectoral plans and uh, when we talk about air pollution sources, we are looking at evidence-based decision making and the entire air pollution from sources to pathways to the impact we are targeting each and every aspect. Now two, three you know, key points that I feel are important. One is that it is not just a local issue. Sumit also talked about there are contributions from across the borders, there are regional contributions. In Delhi, there are contributions you know, from surrounding towns. So essentially, we have to you know, tackle uh, sources, not only in the local uh, environment, but also all the sources that are, that are contributing uh, to air pollution. Then actions have to be guided by the science. Again, the source apportionment studies essentially tells us as to which are the sources that are, that are contributing, uh, meaning that we can prioritize our actions and target the sources uh, which have uh, larger contributions. If you look at the side, secondary particles, which have a major share, and when we talk about secondary particles, meaning that we don't have to focus our attention only to the sources that are emitting particles, but also the SOX and NOX sources. You know, therefore, the power plants have stricter norms for SOX and NOX have been prescribed. All of them are going to install FGDs, uh, not to control SO2, but to control uh, particulate matter. Third key component is, when we talk about governance, when we talk about actions on ground, it is to identify the critical period. When we analyze the data, uh, we understand that, you know, which are the months which are more critical. Essentially, winter months in Delhi and CR or indo gangetic plain uh, have more critical uh, air pollution levels. Uh, therefore, uh, it tells us that our actions need to be intensified more and more uh, during the winter season. More teams to be deployed on ground for controlling. So, you know, this also is an essential component when we talk about action planning. Then prioritize the sources and actions based on the health impact. If you look at this, the first column, we have PM10 and the vehicle contribution is hardly 7 to 8 percent. This I'm talking about in terms of emissions. So if you look at PM10 emissions, the vehicle could look at, uh, could be a low priority. But the moment you start looking at the harmful effects, the next column, uh, which is the carbon. Now EC contribution from vehicles goes more than 30 percent. So while I look at PM10, vehicle doesn't get that priority. The moment I start looking at particles as health concern, the vehicles become uh, topmost priority. So that also has to somewhere figure in uh, when we plan our actions. Coming to important component of network designing, uh, we are going to have a <coughs> continuous, a manual and optimal a mixture of all these you know, different types of uh, monitoring systems. Uh, we are also looking at expanding the network for PM2.5, which is more harmful uh, because of its size fraction and also because of the fact that these are emitted from uh, combustion uh, sources. Uh, so therefore, a uh, quick expansion of PM2.5 network that we are targeting. Uh, we are also looking at the low-cost sensors. There are issues, I understand, uh, but uh, some indigenous sensors are being developed. And our understanding is that even if they are not giving very accurate results, even if we had you know, 10 to 15 percent of uh, you know, error and uh, the known error, uh, then probably uh, this could be installed and then used to get uh, larger information on air quality in a uh, limited uh, time period. And of course, uh, certification system. Uh, we have uh, engaged or authorized National Physical Laboratory. Now we have our own uh, certification system to begin with PM10 and PM2.5 uh, samplers. Uh, 
the facility is now set up and then we can have uh, certification and then thereby more of uh, indigenous uh, may coming in uh, for monitoring equipment. In terms of implementation approach, as I said, we'll look at the design. The chemical speciation need to be an integral part. As of now, we are doing limited uh, source apportionment and chemical speciation, but it has to be an integral part of the overall network. And uh, we also want to uh, set up a 10 city super network, uh, which has to be operated by a single agency uh, with more focused uh, quality uh, requirements and then good data quality. I talked about this. Action planning for 102 non attainment towns and cities. There are city specific plans. In fact, more than 80 plans were already there. And uh, now, with the intervention of uh, Honorable NGT, uh, there are committees set up in the states which are again scrutinizing this, these plans. And 60 plus plans now are finalized uh, through these committees. So, these plans will have or time targeted actions uh, dealing with all major sources uh, in the city and then also the agencies which are responsible to act uh, have been identified. Our source apportionment studies of course will be taken up. Uh, it's not necessary that all 102 cities will have to go for extensive source apportionment. So we are also working as to what kind of uh, the data requirements or what kind of tools that should be used uh, when we do. It's not necessary that we have a chemical mass balance model, we have detailed chemical speciation uh, data available with us. Maybe with uh, you know simpler uh, uh, tools and technique, PMF model or with limited data or maybe we group them, uh, group the cities together uh, with the sources and the information that we have and then do limited studies and then uh, extend uh, that knowledge to other uh, cities. So, but inventory, indoor air quality management, I think there is limited uh, time, so I won't get into the details. Uh, but as I said that uh, the knowledge will be the key. We are going to establish an information center, which will have expert, and then provide information to all the stakeholders, guide them. The forecasting system is already there for four uh, towns and cities. We are looking forward to expanding it. We are looking at the different tools, so the statistical tool, or we have a complex, you know, WRF kind of model which require data. So we're exploring all these options as to what uh, can deliver uh, the goods in the given uh, limited time frame. And of course, intensive awareness and training will be there. So I think uh, uh, in the time that I have, uh, this is what uh, I can share with you. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Garko. So uh, it's, it's indeed encouraging to see this, this framework, but of course the challenge will be in, uh, in the implementation and the tracking, and uh, we look forward to adopting this framework. There is hope, as we've seen in the examples of London, major Chinese cities, New York, uh, biggest cities in the world uh, have addressed this problem, and I'm sure um, with the CPCB and MOEF, um, uh, we will systematically get to the root of this problem and reverse uh, the, the situation that we see ourselves in. So with that, uh, we have some time for a Q&A, Sumit, uh, do we? Yeah, a few minutes. Um, if you'd like to, uh, if you have a question, kindly uh, identify yourselves. Uh, and if it's addressed to any of our, uh, any particular panel member, please let us know. Uh, and once we... Uh, finish with this round of Q&A, we'll move to the second session. So are there any questions? Yes. The, in China, the decision to uh, reduce coal consumption uh, from coal oil plants, was that uh, primarily driven by air pollution or climate or a combination of both? Uh, for, the, for the last five years, the number one reason is uh, air quantity. Uh, the one of the uh, one of the supporting material is uh, inventory and source apportionments. And the very beginning, most of the Chinese city they can see both the receptor model or emission pie charts. Uh, the core burning related is uh, number one, 
uh, not only the power plant, but also industrial and households. So people feeling if you want to get the better air quality, you have to solve the coal related issue first. Thank you. My question is to Dr. Frank Kelly. Um, did you notice any uh, economic impact of the congestion charges and uh, uh, impact on jobs, sales uh, in, in London uh, uh, when you implemented that? And second question is, how was the implementation done uh, with so many cars? Uh, did you have uh, you know, use of IT or how is it that was done? Thank you. So, uh, when we introduced the congestion charging scheme in 2003, there was a lot of public opposition to the scheme, uh, but it was introduced and it, the polls in the next 18 months showed that the people had really changed their views because they were able to see overnight a benefit in respect of fewer vehicles on the city streets. Even those, those that were still paying the charge uh, to come in were, were obviously suffering financially because of that. So there was a complete change about, which I think if we had just left it to the public vote to begin with, it would never have come in. In fact, that was the, the case in the city of Manchester where they did have a public vote and they didn't bring it in. Uh, the, the second part of your question to do was uh, really uh, to do with, uh, was there a loss in uh, economic benefit in any way? Uh, I think the, the, the fact was that it, at that particular time, and for the scheme which is coming in in two months' time, there are support mechanisms being put in place which will help individuals who are running small businesses to replace their vehicles. Now, they won't be able to do it for totally for free. They will have to make some commitment, but there is a considerable uh, benefit to them if they do uh, as they move their business forward under those cleaner air rules. There's a third part was uh, the tracking. Did you use information? So, the, yes, to be able to run a scheme like this and to ensure that uh, it is viable in respect of people not cheating on it and adhering to it, then there was an automatic number plate recognition system, uh, which was already in London because of security reasons, but it was expanded greatly across the city. So every vehicle movement within the M25 is captured on a, on a camera. And uh, initially that was just for compliance reasons to ensure people were not cheating or they were being uh, sent out a payment notice if they were coming into the city. But in fact, the authorities soon realized that this was a great source of emissions information for the city. And this was one of the reasons the city was able to upgrade its emissions inventory, uh, because they understood all the surface vehicle movements within the city. And that was a great advantage. Thank you. And the cars, uh, it's not just uh, the, the cars, but they're all cars. But the loss of business, because uh, people won't come in to buy anything? Uh, the people coming into the city to shop actually find out by taking public transport it is much simpler than driving into the city, paying an extra congestion charge and paying a large amount for parking. So actually they use the underground system and they use the overground bus system uh, and the railway system extensively, which have been expanded, the whole three sectors have been expanded a lot in the last 20 years. Yes. This is a question to Prashant Gargav. You see, Sumit in his presentation mentioned about the need for dose response curves for Indian, uh, Indian population profiles. And a lot of the controversy around the economic impacts of air pollution done by agencies like the World Bank and others centers on whether the dose response curves developed in other parts of the world are appropriate. Now, you made a presentation on the National Clean Air uh, Program, but I didn't see that there was any component of research on, on developing national dose response curves. And of course, you know, we have to be very careful here because all PM10 and all PM2.5 is not the same. Species can make a huge difference. And also synergistic effects. I mean, they are very, very difficult to capture statistically. 
but but so my question is that uh, that uh, is there any supplementary program for developing national those response curves? So it is there, sir. It is there. In fact, uh, for 20 cities, there is a very comprehensive uh, health studies plan, which also would have uh, developing those response as a component of it. So it's definitely there. Uh, uh, but uh, the fact remains that uh, it affects, and therefore uh, many of the actions of many of the policies are uh, targeting for no regret. Uh, options. So, but it is definitely there. How are we doing for time? Okay, one last, one last question. Yes. Uh, I have a follow-up question uh, on the London uh, emissions charge. How was the level of the charge determined? I mean, for it to be an effective deterrent, was it just a trial and error, or was there sort of some basis for determining the quantum of the charge? And my second question is to uh, Dr. Prashant Gargav. Um, the funding for implementing the NCAP, is it going to be shared between the center and the states? How are you going to determine, I mean, is it going to be an entirely center-driven initiative? Are you uh, going to require the states to also put in resources? How will you ensure ownership uh, from the states? Thank you. So the charge was based on uh, quite a lot of initial uh, survey work and modeling work. Uh, there was an aim to reduce the number of vehicles by at least 50,000 a day, and it was therefore the, the charge that was set had to be uh, within the realm where that may happen. Uh, that was seen to be uh, a success for the administration if they achieved that. They actually achieved 70,000 vehicles uh, a day with the, uh, the charge when it came in to begin with, which if I remember rightly was I think it was maybe six, six pounds. Since then it's had to increase with inflation. The current charge, which uh, will be an extra 12 pounds 50, taking it to 25 pounds a day, is really quite exorbitant indeed for, for any society, I think, and it has really been based on the fact that they really want to stop vehicles coming into the city totally and they want to have a eventually a, a vehicle free centre of London. And as you rightly said, there has to be ownership. So essentially it will be a central and a state, you know, both funding together. And there are different, you know, sectoral plans of different ministries, you know, such a Bharat mission and a smart city, there are a lot of funding available. So wherever uh, the funding is available would be you know, utilized for those sectoral uh, actions. But it will be combined, joint uh, by state and then center. One more question, question Thank you, Chair and the presenters. Uh, my name is Vijay Sharma, and I worked with Prashant for many years. And my question essentially addressed to Prashant, but any of the uh, other presenters can wave. Closer to it. Sorry. Sir, my poser is that uh, has Prashant in his various studies also factored in, apart from the science, technology, the monitoring, the modern equipment, also taken into consideration uh, social behavior, uh, the maverick uh, behavior. Uh, of course, that is more relevant for the water pollution uh, habits and coliform bacteria and the awkwardness with which. Uh, but on the air uh, pollution side, like biomass burning, I think people are needlessly, it's not just to uh, get away from the cold, uh, even at 11 o'clock in the afternoon, beautiful sunshine, people just play cards on the, and this was not the fact earlier, uh, adulterated, uh, fuels, uh, inefficient engines, not getting them serviced. I think this is going to be very, very important in the days to come. And we now have laws on the subject. We didn't have laws earlier uh, on biomass burning and also the reasons why uh, groundwater and surface water is getting polluted with coliform bacteria. Thank you. So social behavior uh, in the study per se, there is, uh, I mean, not much done. But in the last few years, at least three, four years, I'm aware of, that a uh, uh, whole lot of attention is being given to this. If I can take example of uh, crop residue burning, in two years in Punjab and Haryana and this part, uh, there has been a lot of efforts on 
reaching out to the farmers, educating them, uh, bringing some sort of behavioral change in them. Uh, but yes, it's very important, but uh, not being dealt uh, the way it should have been. And the NCAP also envisages when we talk about public awareness, uh, will be you know social behavior a component there. I think just one point which I wanted to add here. I mean, we are talking about uh, farmers, which some of them may not be so educated. Let's talk about people who are educated sitting in Delhi and only 30% of them are going for PUC checks. And you know, that's a staggering number. It, it itself shows the level of awareness we have about the impacts of air pollution. We really don't worry how well our uh, you know, vehicle is maintained and what kind of emissions it is emitting, and that is actually you know, hurting us only. So I think we need a considerable amount of work in raising the level of awareness on this issue, and uh, we need to work on it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay, so with that, uh, I'd like to draw this session to a close. My thanks to Mr. Gargo, Professor Kelly, Professor Kevin Hay, and uh, Dr. Sharma uh, for their, their comments and uh, to the audience for, the, for their questions. I believe we have a, a fairly interesting uh, conversation that will follow. And uh, with that, we'll bring this to an end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dhawan. A round of applause for the chair for moderating this session so well. Thank you, Dr. Gargav. For the next session, uh, I request Professor Hekeben and Professor Frank Kelly to remain seated. And I request Dr. Ashok Ghosh, Chairman, Bihar State Pollution Control Board, and Dr. Anshu Bhardwaj, Executive Director, C-STEP, to join in the panelists. And we'll have an exciting session, uh, a panel discussion on this important issue. I request Ms. Alun Young, Director of Global Air Pollution and Environment Program, Bloomberg Philanthropies, to chair and moderate this session. Thank you. Um, for this session, um, we have a very um, diversified group of panelists. We have representatives from um, Indian government, um, NGO, and some international um, experts. But I would like to really um, invite um, Dr. Gush to, from um, Bihar State Pollution Control Board to start. And, and my first question um, to you is, could you help us understand what are the major efforts um, that's going on in your state and what you um, consider to be the main challenges that you are facing? Yeah, to begin with, uh, my state, Bihar, it is always in the red area because we are in the Gangetic Plain. And there are geogenic regions also. Uh, actually, uh, if you see the formation of the earth in our area, the origin took place in the Sinojoic. And most of the soil is very soft. And dust formation is very excessive. So we are prone to air pollution. We have maximum problem up to PM 2.5. That is the real problem that we have. In last uh, six, seven months, we have done lots of efforts to mitigate it because most of the cities, they're highly polluted. And three of the cities are always uh, in picture. That is the Patna and uh, Bodh Gaya and Mujapurpur, three cities. We have taken some initiatives and we are the first state uh, in India to have a scientific evidence-based clean air action plan. We are working with uh, Adri and C-STEP and Sakti Foundation, and they have done lots of scientific studies, and based on that, the air action plan is, has been prepared. It is not there that we have uh, used secondary data. We have generated primary data, and based on that, we have prepared the uh, air action plan. Then we are also, we had the problem of different stakeholders and different line departments in government also. The power was not centralized with the Central Pollution Control Board. We have many departments that, that stakeholders like transport department, urban development department, Patna Municipal Corporation. Fortunately, now we have a, a strong coordination committee uh, with representative from all the line departments. And everybody is sensitized now. Their, their role has been defined that which department will do what. And some actions have been also initiated. For instance, we have taken a very strong step against the brick kilns because Bihar is the hub of brick kilns. We have around 6,000 brick kilns in Bihar. And out of 6,000, uh, already 2,000 of them, they have converted to cleaner technology. They have adopted the jig technology and they're functional. For the remaining 4,000, we have given the deadline. 
that before the 31st of this August this year, all of them, they have to convert the zigzag technology. And the Brick Clean Association have also promised to abide by that rule. Even the court has ruled in our favor that beyond uh, August 31st, we are not going to allow the old brick kilns. We have to convert to cleaner technology, not essentially zigzag, any cleaner technology. Then uh, we have also done the data-driven uh, approach to all the problems uh, uh, concerned with air pollution. And one of the problems that we had, that we have only three monitoring stations, online monitoring stations, very limited number. To compensate that, we have already got sanction from government for eight more. Eight more stations will be installed very soon. And as uh, earlier speaker said, uh, uh, that we are also trying to have low-cost monitors in different parts. Actually, in Bihar, right now, only three cities are there with the bad name. But the reason is there that in other cities, there is no continuous air quality monitoring station. If you apply in all the cities, the majority of the cities of Bihar, including the three that is in red zone, that will come in the picture. And also, Bihar, Bihar, State, Public, uh, Bihar State Pollution Control Board has collaborated now for scientific study with Adri, C-STEP, and Urban Emissions, and support uh, from Bloomberg and Sakti Foundations, through which we are going to go forward. And we are positive that Bihar will be leading as far as their air quality control is concerned. And our estimate is there, the, the study, joint study done by the group, estimates that if all the steps that is a part of our uh, air, clean air action plan is implemented, implemented by 2030, there will be reduction of up to 69%. That is more, more than, much more than the India average. So we are optimistic, we are hopeful, and all the line departments are coordinating. Regarding challenges, just I will say one line that, uh, uh, as usual, the first challenge is the, the bringing the, all the stakeholders on one platform. That was a difficult job, you know, in government departments. Uh, there is no strong coordination for a common role, common job. But fortunately, that has been resolved now, and our political uh, bosses, like our chief minister and deputy chief minister, is also sensitive towards that. And through their efforts, now all the line departments are on one platform. We are thinking together, we are acting together, and that is a positive sign. The other problem is there that all, all, almost everywhere, not only in our state, but in, in all the other states, the, the perception of public is there that controlling air pollution is uh, only government's problem, not our problem. Somehow, community participation is required. Involvement of the, 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 the co common public is very essential. They have to understand that in controlling the air pollution, their role is also there. We have strengthened PUC also. That was also a problem. I heard that only 30% uh, vehicles are going for check. The same thing is there in Bihar also, but now it is very strongly being followed and we have started new uh, new stations, PUC centers, and hopefully the, the laws will be taken seriously in the coming days. So these are the challenges that is facing us. Thank you. Um, I, we have um, with us here um, today also um, Dr. Enshu from um, CSEP, which is actually one of the organization um, mentioned um, also working um, in the state of Bihar. Um, could you also introduce um, your experience um, from NGO perspective? Thank you, Adel. Uh, so we in CSEP have been working on uh, uh, studies focused in a few cities. Uh, one is in Bangalore, where we are doing an emissions inventory and a source apportionment study. And the second is in, we recently completed a, a clean air plan for Patna, as Dr. Ghosh mentioned. And two more projects are currently underway in Gaya and Muzaffarpur in, uh, in Bihar. So I'll just draw upon some experiences from these projects and uh, in, my talk, in, in my comments. I just have four short comments, uh, which, are, uh, which we experienced. One is on the positive side, we felt that the, the air pollution is now a very high priority subject in, uh, in the policy radar. Uh, even in a city like Bangalore, which where air pollution levels are not as hazardous as Delhi, air pollution is very high on the policy radar. Uh, there is an air quality monitoring cell set up by the government, which the chief secretary personally monitors. Uh, there's a meeting called almost every month, uh, where we are also participating. 
So that shows the level of seriousness which uh, is being accorded. Uh, in Patna, during the course of our project and interactions with the uh, BSPCB, um, the Deputy Chief Minister himself took keen interest in the project and he was very closely involved in the finding of the study and uh, uh, he was uh, very passionately involved in the entire project. So that is one part. That is, it is, I think it has reached a point where policymakers, the politicians are taking uh, serious note. Second point was, uh, which has been mentioned earlier, is the increasing role of data and evidence in, uh, in making analysis. Uh, this includes uh, measurement and modeling and policy economic analyses. This is a bit hard because in many cases data is not easily available. So what happens is typically when air quality in cities reaches alarming levels, uh, often uh, we resort to knee-jerk reactions. Uh, in the absence of informed analysis, we take knee-jerk steps that let's try this, let's try that, uh, without really knowing whether what will be the impact on air pollution and what will be the associated uh, the uh, health benefits. So in that sense, uh, the, the building up of emissions inventory across major cities in the country is incredibly important and that, that's something which, is, which came up. Uh, third was that uh, the, the link from knowledge to policy. So even if you do all these source apportionment studies, you do all the emission inventories, you build up a huge database of knowledge. Um, the link from that to policy is often difficult because most often the policy decisions are political in nature. And obviously the political executive would like to make sure they are uh, comfortable with taking those steps. And hence the need for sound analysis and cost implications the health benefits, trying to quantify as much as possible. For example, in the Patna study, which, uh, which um, uh, we did with the support of Shakti Foundation, in that we try to quantify as much as possible the cost of each mitigation option and the associated health benefit. So it was a, so that we, one can argue with the departments, one can argue with the policy makers that look, if you do this, this is the cost which you will incur and this is the benefit you, the, you will have. Uh, same goes in the Bangalore emissions inventory, which we are now trying to do with the support of Bloomberg. The focus is the same. We are trying to quantify as much information as possible so that decision making uh, is facilitated. And lastly, one last comment I, uh, the, is the fact that, you know, the, uh, given India's challenge that 50% of our population is expected to reside in urban areas in say 20, 30 years from now, and given that scale, only a handful of institutions today have the expertise or capacity to do what is required in these cities in terms of monitoring and modeling, uh, economic and policy analyses, and uh, the, uh, the modeling of air pollution studies. Uh, uh, either that expertise is vested in some academic institutions or some very few s uh, state pollution control boards or a handful of think tanks. So clearly the capacity needs to be really uh, sort of non-linearly multiplied to cope with what we have to deal with. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think both um, Dr. Um, Gosh and Dr. Ansh mentioned about um, the challenge that is um, uh, problems are quite big, but normally resources are quite um, limited. My next question is um, to uh, Professor Huckabin. Just the, in your experience, what we s often see is um, this big tension between um, when you try to deal with air pollution, how much is the resources that should really go into building up um, a, a, an air pollution monitoring system, the, the, the basic um, infrastructure um, versus the kind of resources required to really take quick actions um, with some of the um, sectors that are emitting very fast. What is the experience of finding that balance right, especially when um, the resources, the capacity is quite low? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So when we're trying to improve the air quality, air concentration, the monitoring is just help you to identify the, the problem. But the real, uh, the re want to solve this problem, the final measure is uh, to cut down the emissions. That is a very basic actions. 
So I just uh, heard the national uh, program uh, for air pollution control in India. I think it's covered a you know, very uh, important part. Uh, very impressed that they, ha they, they have uh, improved by 20 to 20, uh, 30 percent within five years. Uh, I think it's very uh, ambitious. Also, uh, it's very tough job. Uh, uh, so first, I think it's not only taking the targets at the national level, uh, uh, the, the, the national average. Uh, so just take the China's case, uh, uh, five years ago, uh, now see, uh, six years ago, and they have uh, regional targets and also re divided into uh, a provincial and cities. So uh, each city and each year, they have their own targets. So uh, for example, they have 25% improve within five years, and every year they, they will have five, uh, for some of the city even more. So each year the mayor will report to the Congress, and the next year they will report, say, have you finished your homework for the last year? Uh, they will report the newspaper and TV will following up. So once you cannot finish it, the, the, the mayor has a very strong uh, pressure. So you talk about the balance. The first, the decision maker, the politicians, they were getting their balance, so they, how to allocate it, the, the resources. And then they will ask the professors or uh, the researchers uh, like me, so how can I identify more sensitive uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sources? And then I can get the next money, but get some more reductions. So 10 years ago, you always uh, said, experts getting the uh, proposal, uh, the suggestions to the, uh, to the decision maker. Uh, but recently, it's the opposite way. It's not your uh, submit to the proposal. It's uh, the mayor will require you should help me to do something, not only in the central level, provincial level, but more and more the city level. So the, 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 the balance, I think the balance uh, the the, uh, the uh, original driving force should be from the uh, the decision maker, like the mayor. But the mayor should feeling the pressure for for the air quality is one of the problem for their pressure. Like the uh, the job opportunity, the growth rate of GDP, it's the same level, almost the same level. So I think that is a very important. Of course, uh, we, when we're getting more and more inventory problem, source approach problem, and cost benefits or cost effectiveness analysis, and then you can generate some more and more. Here, I think uh, they have uh, following all of them, all of the part of them. But the important thing is if you're, go, you, if you're doing that for the national wise, almost 100 cities were doing it. So I think that the board, the technical board, will help to establish some kind of working group to doing the QA, QC problem. So you have to, uh, under the same technical uh, basis, same technical methodology. So otherwise, you, you, will, you will waste your resource. The, the data, you, you generate a lot of data, but they are not uh, comparative mm -hmm. in each other. So the, uh, uh, in China, we have uh, similar things than like India, we have a lot of universities, uh, larger population people, uh, the countries. So there is a different group, say, I can do emission inventory, I can do source apportionments, but you have to get in the insurance, the, the QA, QC for, and the methodology at the very beginning. So I suggest that the board should establish several technical working group and uh, help to uh, you to do the technical labor working. Thank you. Yeah, two points. Uh, one is the, the gap between the activities and policy makers. Regarding my state, I'm sure that that gap is not there as of now. And just for example, 16th of this month, Chief Minister himself has called a meeting on Clean Air Action Program in which all the line departments will be represented. 
and at that level many policy changes will be introduced. So it is not that the only policy control board or department of environment and forest is sensitive towards the air pollution. But even the government level, so I don't think that in Bihar there is much problem as far as now uh, policy change is concerned. Government is ready for policy changes to accept the positive suggestions and not only suggestions but also to finance the uh, money required for implementation of the action plan. Because, you know, preparing the action plan is one thing and implementation is another thing. Implementation requires huge money and, you know, uh, uh, every state is not in a position to fulfill all the uh, money demands. And fortunately, uh, central government is also now ready to address this problem. And hopefully with the joint intervention of the two, things will improve. Things will improve in future, uh, as far as my state is concerned. And regarding the data that he was talking about, that uh, data is fragmented, I agree with you that the different states, they are doing some studies at their own. And uh, data is fragmented, no doubt. But as of now, uh, we have two cities with uh, common agencies, Bangalore and Patna. Uh, and not only Patna, but uh, Gaya also and Mujapurpur also. Uh, slowly, we are planning that we can prepare one website, the interactive website, where similar data can be uploaded by other departments also. That can be a knowledge hub. Uh, I already talked with uh, Adri about these issues and hopefully with the collaboration with government and Sakti Foundation and Adri and C-STEP, they're working as a team. If we are able to do that, that may be an open domain and every state can upload their information, basic data, that will be a good thing to do. As of now, we don't have a very scientific data for all the states. In Bihar also, we have started getting the data, but I cannot say that we have whole data available right now. More studies are required is going on and this is a good thing that if it can be done that at all India level some information portal can be created on which every state can upload their informations and the basic data because uh, you know with air pollution uh, primary uh, baseline data is missing in many parts of India but that has to be addressed by joint efforts and collective supervision of CPCB also uh, hopefully CPCB will also initiate some action towards that. Um, this, yeah, this question of um, data keeps coming up. I want to um, actually turn to um, Professor um, Frank Kelly. I think um, it was mentioned by a few speakers about um, the promise of low-cost sensors when um, it, 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 um, it might not uh, uh, be feasible within a very short period of time to have the state of art um, a regulatory uh, monitoring system, what could um, the local sensor bring? Um, and I know that the city of London actually is um, experimenting um, some of the local uh, sensors and could you just share some of those experiences and how you um, see um, the, the use of those the technologies um, in the case of um, India? Okay, thank you, Elon. So uh, I think you've noticed today that we've been talking about numbers and uh, it's micrograms per meter cubed or a PPM, BBB for all these different pollutants. And the issue is we do that because there is a limit value that's been set or an air quality guideline that's been set. And that is really the magic number. If we're above that, then we're uh, doing very badly. If we're below that, we're in regulation and everybody can be happy and, and not worry too much about the health effects of the air we're breathing. So actually getting that number right is very important. Uh, it's important from a regulatory point of view. And what has happened is we have built up across the world regulatory systems which use very expensive equipment. Uh, they're partly expensive because they're very sensitive uh, and they're robust. Uh, and they're actually well maintained. There are protocols which require regular maintenance on these pieces of equipment and importantly, regular calibration of that equipment. So it adheres to a, a, an agreed SAN protocol, which means that the numbers that are coming out are believable and reliable. So we hear about low cost sensors. So why are they potentially good for us and why, why are they potentially bad? Well, low cost means great, we can have more of them, we can spread networks across the city, we can maybe move them about because they're portable, 
But on the other hand, because they're low cost, they're not going to be as robust. They're maybe not going to be as sensitive. They're maybe going to be more problematic. And that is typically seen with the low cost PM sensors at the moment. They're very, very sensitive to, hum to humidity. So if humidity changes, you will get a change in the PM concentration that the monitor is reading. It's not because the PM's changed, it's because the humidity that the PM is in that you're measuring has changed. So that, is that a problem? Well, if you're close to the regulatory standard, it could be, because you could get misled. If you're in the hundreds of micrograms of uh, per meter cubed to PM, then maybe it doesn't matter. It's just giving you an indicate or that things are, are, are bad and you need to do something about it. So it's really down to this saying, it's horses for courses. It's what are you going to use this low cost sensor for? I think if you're gonna try and use it for regulatory purposes, then you're on a hiding to nothing. You're going to get misinformation. Uh, you're going to end up maybe spending a lot of money in the wrong way. If you're using it for education purposes, awareness purposes, as we do in the UK at the moment, then I think it's very, very useful. It's, it's really empowered a lot of people, a lot of NGOs to go out there and to make their own measurements and to believe that the, what they're breathing in is not, is not healthy. Now finally, we are looking at these in cities uh, in Europe, in London and in Paris. Well, why are we doing that? Well, we think that there may be a future in low cost monitoring. We don't think it's there yet, but we have such good monitoring systems, regulatory systems in place in these cities, we can go out and we can test these monitors. We can test them across the different seasons, under different conditions, and we can get to know what the quirks are, what the strengths and the weaknesses are. And maybe, in due course, we will come up with equipment, or the, the, uh, the field will come up with equipment which is more rust, robust and which can be used in areas where there is not regulatory monitoring at this point in time. Uh, we are talking about some cities in India, but we're also talking about the whole continent of Africa where there's very little monitoring available at the moment. So there is a future for low-cost monitoring. It's not there at the moment. I think you need to be very, very wary, very careful about it, but doesn't mean to say we shouldn't embrace technology and move forward carefully with it. Um, and I, I guess the key message is that um, a robust um, station um, uh, regulatory um, monitoring system is still um, a must. Um, with that, I think I want to um, maybe open up to the um, audience to see whether there's any um, questions. And, and I, um, do we still have the microphone? Yes, please here. Okay. No, I'm just asking that, uh, of course, we are think, talking about emission. If you talk pollution, pollution is emission minus absorption. So there, there are, if you plant if, uh, trees of a specific type, these trees can help you in absorbing pollution. But focus is only on managing and regulating emission. Why not? There should be both. You re re restrict the emission as well as try to get the things absorbed with uh, a specific planting, particularly the places like Delhi where a lot of pollution is coming from outside. There could be a specific model of planting which can absorb or don't allow the pollution. It's like you are talking about Bihar, a lot of dust coming. The, suppose Patna, in around Patna, if you have a shelter well plantation which can uh, stop the pollutants coming to the city. Why not think in that line? Thank yeah, uh, can I answer? Sure, please, yes. Uh, actually, your question, is, suggestion is very right. And already we have initiated the process. Because you know, Patna is at the bank of river Ganga. And Ganga has shifted towards north. And the long stretch, big stretch of land that is Domur Ganga. And it is exposed, no plantation is there. And lots of wind is coming from the north side towards city and that brings lots of dust. So we have a comprehensive plan already from Department of Environment and Forest to have about 10,000 plantation in that area where the river has receded. And also we are going for roadside plantation. <coughs> that is also in government planning. And uh, exact number is not decided yet, but I think that in coming rainy season, there will be a long way. Haryali mission is also there in Bihar and that is also active. And city planners are uh, planning for this uh, monsoon when lots of plantation will be done in the city area. 
roadside plantation because many pavements are there that is exposed and it, it can be utilized. And you rightly said that uh, emission is one thing and absorption is other thing. So absorption can compensate. I agree with you and we are working in that direction also. Thank you for your suggestion. Yeah, let me add some information. Uh, you are right. I think uh, especially for the uh, for the uh, coarse part particulates, larger particulates. So in 1970s, in Beijing and uh, northern China, we have a very serious problem for THP and even the soundstorm, 1970s and the 80s. So they have doing uh, almost uh, more than 20 years plans, uh, and it's helped for you know, to control the large particulates. And also it's helped for uh, some of the next like, SO2 and NOx. So uh, in recent years, we become to next like, PM2.5 problem. So uh, the, uh, the, the uh, plants can help us. But the problem is we cannot, we, that is only one uh, effort, uh, control measures because the industrialization, urbanization, and motorization process is so rapid. So we cannot only do that, and also we should cut down the emission. Uh, my feeling is, this is a sixth, sixth time for me to uh, come to India. The first time is before uh, 15 years ago. So my feeling is you have a, quite similar process, uh, you know, urbanization, uh, industrialization, and also the car population. So the control measure uh, for the cut down the emission, we have to do that. And the second uh, problem is uh, air quality is a regional problem. It's not the one city's problem. So in China, uh, after uh, several, uh, more than 10 years uh, approach, uh, we have identified the sensitive area, uh, for example, Beijing and surrounding area, we identify uh, 28 city as a one group. It's a city cluster. So they, they should do something together. Otherwise, it's not help. One uh, independent city cannot solve this problem. You are right, thank you. Um, thank you, let me um, maybe get um, a couple of other questions together and, and, and take back to the panel. International Council on Clean Transportation. Uh, question really to Frank Kelly, uh, because you can bring from the UK experience, uh, what ways have been used, uh, legal or otherwise, to hold the government entities accountable for meeting the ambient air quality standards, and what lessons you might tell uh, our Indian friends uh, from that experience about uh, where we need to be vigilant in getting these uh, ambitions translated into reality. Thank you for that question. It's a very, very important one. Uh, we have in the UK Parliament, we have a environmental audit committee, which is made up of all the different uh, parties in power at that point in time. And this committee has sat and examined the air quality uh, history, I suppose, of the government's actions three times now in the last decade. And each time, this cross-party committee has come out with a damning report of the government's uh, record in this area. So, you would think that would be quite embarrassing to the government. Well, it made absolutely no difference whatsoever. They just said that, as usual, they had ambitions, uh, they would do this and they would do that, but there was nothing really which was set in law. So that did not work, examination at that level. What did work was an NGO called Client Earth coming and taking the UK government to court three times for breaking the NO2 limit value and three times winning so this became a major embarrassment to the government and uh, it led to an improvement in understanding by the media and by the voters that there was something wrong about the quality of the air that they were breathing. This led then to a whole series of our national newspapers taking up this uh, challenge that why was the government not doing something about this? We were helped along the way, of course, by 
uh, Volkswagen gate or diesel gate where car manufacturers were shown to be acting illegally. Uh, that, along with the government being embarrassed on a number of occasions, I think is what led to a change in heart of the current UK government and the publish, their publishing their clean air uh, plan uh, a few months uh, before you did here in India. And I think there is real hope now in the UK uh, which used to be only at the city level, as I was telling you, for London and, and now our other metropolitan areas are doing similar things. But I think there's real hope at the national government level that this issue is finally going to be taken seriously. But it, they needed to be pulled and cajoled and embarrassed for that to happen. Um, very interesting. I think that is uh, really um, an example of how um, civil society um, can also um, help um, hold the government accountable. I wonder whether Dr. Ash wants to also just add to this. Well, yeah, the, the Indian experience also has been very similar to what Frank <coughs> described. Uh, many of the, if you look at our history, the last 20 odd years, many of the significant uh, decisions in air pollution have come from a court mandate. Like if you were to go back in 19, late 1990s or early 2000s, the decision to switch to CNG in Delhi was a decision of the Supreme Court, which was championed by the Center for Study of Environment, CSC, and they pushed that and eventually Supreme Court uh, mandated, which led to the rollout of the CNG vehicles. Likewise, some of the recent uh, decisions uh, in the last 5-10 years also have been because of the Supreme Court uh, uh, committee EPCA, which monitors Delhi's air quality. So yes, I uh, I think I uh, uh, the these have been court orders. Having said that, I think now there is we are reaching a point where most cities are awakening, and it's not that the political executive is completely uh, absolving itself of the challenge. The most cities have taken proactive measures uh, because they see what's happening in Delhi. So I think the situation in smaller towns around the country is that we should not be like Delhi. So I think that is coming up. And uh, hopefully it will be a case of uh, more data and evidence based driven and less of activism which leads to a decision in these cities. Great. Although we have a, a lot of uh, technical experts, but it does feel like the uh, um, importance of keeping the pressure up so that uh, our um, technical experts can um, really um, do their job. Um, I think we have one more um, question here. Do you want to use the... Hello, uh, my name is Vivek Vyas. I am working with the Ministry of Environment and Forest as a consultant on behalf of UNCCD. So, so my question is that one of the major reasons of uh, pollution in Delhi is the stubble burning in Punjab. And uh, so my question to uh, uh, Mr. Ashok Ghosh is that, sir, uh, we have already tried banning, banning stubble burning, and that hasn't worked. So what would you suggest? Should we uh, bring in more incentives, but bringing in for incentives for something bad is always even worse, you know, because if you, uh, you give them incentive, they will uh, even proactively, it's like encroachments on government lands. If you give incentives for uh, regulating encroachments, further more encroachments will come up. So if you, so, so that is the problem at the producer end. At the consumption end also, <coughs> or the suffering end also, if you ask Deliaids to pay for giving it to the stubble burners, that's also a bad incentive. Or should we ask the Deliaids to install more and more air purifiers? So we have four um, uh, solutions. And all of them look equally bad. Yeah, <laughs> the very good question you have asked. Uh, actually, the stubble burning. Uh, I'm personally against incentives. Incentives never solve a problem. If you ask by your personal opinion, I'm against it, against incentive and all, all you know, SOPs, just duplicate them. That never solves the problem. One thing can be done with the stubble burning, that the, the farmers, they should be educated. And the stubble can be used for good purposes. The biomass, and if it's biomass, it can be converted for biofertilizers. It can be also converted for so many other things. So the need for educating the, the, the farmers that how you can earn money from them, not give him money, but to educate them that this can be your wealth. You are burning it, you're not to be burned. It can be used for so many things today, as far as biomass is concerned. And in that, government's efforts and NGO's efforts will be also commendable. Because only government cannot go in remote villages and 
do the education and uh, and plus the technology. Uh, the need for development of a short booklet, sort of booklet for technology, that how this stubble can be utilized for generation of uh, resources, generation of money, wealth. And that way, do you don't need, just you convince them that why you are burning it, if you can earn money from them. So that will be a better way. And at, uh, at, at the onset, I, I told you that air policy is not a problem which can be solved by a single agency or government or pollution control board. There has to be giant efforts between the CSOs and the, the NGOs and every stakeholder. And if some, some sort of, uh, even Sakti Foundation uh, is doing lots of work in that area, uh, it will be a good thing to, to collect the, how the, the stubble can be utilized in creation of the wealth. And many farmers, even well-educated farmers, they don't know what to do with this stubble. So you don't know, then they burn it. But if you educate them that there's money in it, if you convince them there's money in it, then there's no need to give incentive. Just show them the way, that how you can earn money out of it. Then I think that problem can be resolved slowly. That is my opinion, yeah. Interesting. Uh, one small add-on question, sir. Yeah. Uh, in Bihar and UP, double burning is not that big. No. Because people say that uh, if the Punjab farmers use harvesters and combines. Yes. It is a stubble. Whereas in Bihar, the harvesting practice, although it is a bit primitive, but it doesn't lead to that stubble. Yeah, yeah. So should we incentivize farmers not to use the advanced agriculture techniques? No, no. You cannot uh, stop technology. Because technology, if you stop technology, their productivity will be reduced. Then they won't agree. So I don't think that this is possible or practical. The only practical way is that, that educate them that how you earn money out of it. In Bihar, they, of course, there's no problem with that. There was a big problem in Bihar. There is the uh, burning of the plastic waste. And government of Bihar, you might have heard, that already had banned the plastic carry, uh, carry, carry, carry bags of plastic of any length and any size. And at least in the urban area, it is giving uh, good feedback. Because usually, you know, in, in the absence of any good mechanism for uh, solid waste management, people used to burn the waste uh, in, in some corner of the colony. So if, if the plastic was there, it was very toxic. So that has decreased in Patna. So I, in my opinion, uh, you cannot say that don't use technology that, uh, that is uh, harming you. But, you know, economics is the biggest force, you know, in society. You, you tell them, you convince them, that how there is money in the stubble, and then we'll stop burning it and utilizing it. That is the only way out. Thank you. Um, I will take the last round of um, question and then ask our panelists to um, wrap up. We have a question here, and I, I believe there's a question at the back. Oh, okay. Well, so we, let's let's do the question first, and, and there's another question here. Okay. I am Sandeep Tiran from Gale India Limited. So actually, I, my question is to Mr. Frank Kelly. So how do you promote using hydrogen gas as fuel in UK? Um, maybe hold we, when we collect a, a couple more um, here. Front, front row. Oh, yes. Um, could you have the microphone here? This is Avinash from Center for Environment, Energy, and Climate Change at Adri. So my question is basically for Professor Kevin and Frank, where uh, during our course of preparation of the Patna, Gaya, and Muzaffarpur Clean Action Plan, we, we encountered that a lot of policy hindrances do exist. Uh, just to brief that, banning of 15-year-old vehicles in India. Uh, we, don't we need a policy change in the MV Act uh, in terms of uh, installing particulate desert filters into the uh, vehicles. We need uh, a policy change in the MV Hack, which was prepared in 1963. So uh, in terms of some of your experiences, how do you think some of these changes you addressed in your countries uh, to address and implement effectively the control measures? Mm -hmm. um, can we have the, the question? OK. Yes. So my comment is, in terms of the rice stubble, um, my under and, and the stubble burning is that the cost of uh, the labor costs associated with pulling it up for the purpose of uh, biofuels and whatnot is more expensive than the market's willing to pay. So what role do you see regulation potentially playing as, as a counter 
or additional factor in that equation. And then one other question uh, for, for Mr. Frank Kelly. Um, are there any efforts to use artificial intelligence with the low cost sensors to uh, see if there are ways that you can calibrate using data as opposed to just um, using the sensors on their own? Um, so quite a few questions. Okay, um, so very quickly running through H2 gas. Uh, we have not been successful in the UK in implementing a, a national scheme for hydrogen powered vehicles. We've, we had a trial scheme in London 10 years ago where we bought six single decker buses uh, which have been running very, very efficiently every day since then. But the problem was that they cost one quarter of a million pounds each. And so until you get that that order numbers going through the books and the prices fall to something that's compatible to uh, a, a conventional bus then, that's never going to take off. The other problem is the infrastructure for the private vehicles. We only have two hydrogen filling stations in London. I think we have three more across the UK. So I think if a technology like this, which is very feasible, uh, is going to get over that market hump, it needs major investment, I think, by central government. We haven't had that in the UK. Uh, in respect of retrofitting vehicles, etc., it is a very successful approach now. We've done that in our public transport system in buses in London. It has been shown to be extremely successful in certain low emission routes. The problem I see is it has to be monitored uh, going forward because they can deteriorate and unless you uh, have regular monitoring uh, systems in place then I think you could end up uh, going back to where you started down the line. We also have had a lot of problems with the removal of DPFs uh, by back street garages as we call them uh, because if one of these uh, uh, diesel particulate filters needs to be replaced, it's a very large amount of money and it's much, much cheaper just to get rid of it. And again, unless you have something which you have a regular checking system, then uh, you will end up having a lot more emissions than you should do. And then finally, yes, I think the sensor technology is probably reached in my mind at the moment, a peak at the moment, not a lot has changed in the last few years, but where it really has changed is the dealing with the data which the sensors are producing, and that does involve AI, yes. I think there's a future for that. That is a difficult part. The, we have to sum up the cities uh, successful, but sum up them is not. So the some uh, one of the problem is uh, uh, it's difficult to identify uh, is a retrofit not su successful or the driver do not use it properly. So uh, recently we are talking about the uh, we're thinking about the onboard testing system and uh, trying to solve this problem, but it takes money. So some of the cities, like uh, Shenzhen uh, uh, in, in Polar River Delta, they will uh, do that first. So again, it's a still a difficult part, not so easy. Thank you. Say about your yellow scrappage, yellow tag scrappage program. Yeah, that, that is uh, for the, <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Catherine. Yeah, we have uh, uh, the 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 the, uh, the encourage uh, uh, each uh, every several years we will identify uh, the yellow uh, label, uh, the uh, old engine, uh, relatively old engine uh, vehicles, and then they say you are the yellow label. You still can use it, but you get some more and more inconvenience. Uh, so and then the the, the another uh, other sides the the government say we have some money here and attracted you just give us such kind of vehicle as soon as possible. So that is a uh, so-called the yellow labor scrapping system. Thank you. Do you have more to respond to the? Okay. Well, I, I think that uh, I don't have the microphone here, but I uh, maybe I just uh, um, invite each of the panelists to um, 
um, wrap up with uh, really a couple of sentences, uh, um, either um, what uh, for the two international experts, um, what will be the one sentence um, suggestion to our Indian counterpart and also to um, our Indian um, panelists, uh, what will be um, in your mind the most important action um, to take after you finish, leave this room? So should we start with you? Thank you. So very shortly, I would just say, uh, have hope. Uh, there is uh, anything is possible as long as you have, I think, good leadership. None of the issues that you're facing today here in India are new. Uh, there have been solutions already identified for them, uh, but you do need to ensure that uh, the right measures are brought into place. Uh, and for that, I'm afraid you do need good leadership. Yeah, yes. Uh, control planning is just a good start. It's a uh, first step. It's a good start, but enforcement is the most important. Scientific supporting can help the enforcement getting better. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, um, maybe, Dr. Yeah. Uh, I am perpetual optimist. I never lose hope. Uh, one thing I always emphasize uh, that as of technology is concerned uh, for abatement of air pollution or anything, as of today we have lots of technologies. There is no dearth of technology. Problem is the social integration of technology and that has to be local. There are many international technologies, there are successful technologies. We have to modify them under local conditions. And one hope is here that we are together, sitting in this hall. That is the biggest thing, that we are all thinking about this problem. That is on positive note. Let us join hands for future also. And we should not work in isolation, whether it is national body or international body, government bodies or uh, civil societies. They have to join hand because this is not a problem, a minor problem that can be solved by a small group of persons. It needs large stakeholders and contribution from everybody, including the population. And then only this problem can be solved. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, uh, just a couple of comments. We, we in CSTEP are uh, setting up a center for air pollution studies. Uh, we are still in very initial stages. Uh, the cent we have. Uh, this we intend to focus on three broad verticals. One is monitoring and measurement, second is modeling, and third is the economic and policy assessment studies. Uh, we received support from uh, MacArthur Foundation for this, for the center, and we also had support from Shakti and uh, Bloomberg for projects. Uh, so our aspiration is that this center is able to take up studies and projects in various cities as over the years. We, our approach is to work with partners. For example, in the Patna and Bihar studies, we work closely with Adri and, uh, and also with BSPCB. So that's, I believe the scale of challenge that we have in India necessarily requires institutions to work together uh, because the scale is so vast. Thank you. So um, with that, a lot of uh, hope action points and also willingness to collaborate. Um, please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Thank you. And also a wonderful moderator, <laughs> Ms. Helen you. Yang. Thank you so much for this stimulating discussions. I'll not attempt to summarize. I'll just uh, say a few things just to conclude and say goodbye to you. I think there is, uh, you know, clear acceptance that it is an important issue. And what India is trying to do is to catch up and, you know, trying to arrest the growth of pollution at this moment. Um, we hope that in next five to ten years we will see some reduction in the levels and someday we will have a, a achievement of our aim in the quality standards for sure. Uh, clearly it has emerged out that it's a solvable problem. It has been solved in many parts of the world. It's been getting solved in, in countries like China and what we need to do is replication of so many things which have uh, already been tried out. Uh, on few things uh, like data, uh, uh, you know, there are problems across uh, India of different kinds of data generated and we don't even know about it. In this uh, partnership with Bloomberg Philanthropies, we are trying to bring out a knowledge network. Uh, uh, 
it would also have an online repository of uh, all the material related to air quality uh, put up at a single platform which will sort out some of these kind of uh, issues what we'll need is uh, support and uh, you know uh, joining hands together we have a coalition of uh, so many good partners but we'll always need your uh, wisdom and we'll always come back to you with more and more suggestions thank you so much for your attention and uh, we close this session here thank you so much